It's okay to dwell on the things of the past, but perhaps not to stay there. Join us as we have a look at some places that are frozen in time. Hashimi Island, Japan. It's an abandoned island lying in southern Japan and is just one of 505 uninhabited islands in the Nagasaki Prefecture. The island is well known for its abandoned concrete building and is a symbol of the rapid industrialization of Japan. However, it also serves as a dark historical reminder, one of forced labor prior to and during World War II. This island had a dark past where the prisoners of war would be forced into labor and 1,300 of them would then be killed. The island consists of 16 acres and includes coal mines that were established in 1887. In 1959, the island reached its peak of population with 5,259. And then in 1975, the coal reserves began to be nearly depleted and the mine would then be closed. Soon after this occasion, the mine residents would begin to depart, leaving the island abandoned for almost three decades. Then, in the year 2000, interest in the island would peak as people became curious by the undisturbed and historic ruins, and gradually the island developed into a tourist attraction. Some of the collapsed walls of buildings have been restored, and travel to Hashimi has reopened to tourism, resulting in the protection of the island as a site of industrial heritage. And just as well, the island would be approved as a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2015. Inlay Lake, Myanmar. It includes leg rowing and floating gardens in its various reed, but unfortunately, rapid growth, along with increased populations, have put the lake's resources at risk. The second largest lake in Myanmar, it holds one of the highest elevation points at 2,900 feet. The lake also has a number of endemic species, with over 20 species of snails and 9 species of fish that can't be found anywhere else in the world. The lake was also designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2015, and it became Myanmar's first designated place. This expansive lake has about 70,000 citizens that are split into four different cities that border around it. Numerous small villages dot the shores as well, and there are even some villages on the lake itself. Most of those that live in the area are devout Buddhists who live in simple homes made out of wood, along with woven bamboo on stilts. They're also largely self-sufficient farmers. However, if you're trying to get around on this enchanting lake, you'll have to do so by small boat, although somewhat larger boats are also available. Local fishermen are experts at what they do and have even created their own style of rowing in the region, which involves standing at the stern on one leg and wrapping the other leg around the oar. This has been done out of necessity since the lake is covered by floating plants and reeds and the fishermen have a difficult time seeing them while sitting. The food that's served here is also very specific for the region, but nonetheless especially delicious and never seems to disappoint anyone who visits. Kizi Island, Russia The settlements and churches on the island were known from the 15th century, and the population was mostly rural, being forced by the government to help develop ore mining and iron plants in the area. The results of all this turned into a major revolt known as the Kizi Uprising that lasted from 1769 to 1771. And these days, only a single rural settlement remains because most of the villages disappeared from the island by the 1950s. It would then be in the 1950s that dozens of historical wooden buildings were moved to the island from various parts of other areas in order to give them preservation. And now, the entire island and the nearby area form an open-air museum. This museum features more than 80 historical wooden structures, including an old church and a bell tower. Historically, the most important occupation of islanders was actually farming. Because of all the available land, half of the island was then converted into fields, and the other half was rock, being occupied by swamps. Two villages were actually moved from Kizi Island to the nearby infertile mainland in order to free up land for more farming. And up until 1970, the island had about 96 acres, and this made for fantastic growth of grains and potatoes. 
In 1971, the government then forced farming to stop, but some of the fields were reconstructed in 2004. They did so in order to make it part of the Kesey Museum to show how important farming had been to the islanders. Salton Riviera, California. This abandoned massive project consists of Salton Riviera and the ruins of Bombay Beach, which were both part of a thriving resort community just a few miles outside of Los Angeles. These days, it looks more like a ghost town, and even though it is hard to believe, this development did once include 25,000 residential lots with over 250 miles of beautifully paved road, road that featured picturesque views. The area also had electricity, water, and sewage, although today you would never believe it. The area didn't end up becoming a hot spot that the developers had hoped for, due mostly to its isolation and lack of local employment opportunity. The initial design plans included a business district, churches, a golf course, schools, and a luxury hotel yacht club to be complete with its own marina. But even for all of the negatives of the community, it did end up raking in four and a quarter million dollars in sales in the opening weekend. Politicians and Hollywood celebrities also frequented the area, and it would become one of California's most popular retreats. However, all good things do come to an end, as this beautiful resort community had proved. By the 1970s, it had begun to collapse. Most of the buildings were abandoned, and the stench of pollution still remains today, along with quite a number of abandoned relics from the past. Two Guns, Arizona as the white settlers began to populate the town, they quickly realized that Canyon Diablo was an ideal place to cross, first by carriage and then later on by car. The nearby National Trail Highway would be changed to the now famous Route 66, and the residents of Two Guns would serve travelers and tourists on the major highway. Two Guns became a famous stop on Route 66 road trips with a gas station, a motel, and a cafe, along with a souvenir shop for visitors to peruse. A zoo would even be later added and included mountain lions, panthers, and bobcats. The cages were kiln-like structures made out of brick, mortar, and chicken wire and were built along the north wall of the canyon. Then, sadly, after I-40 would be built, it ended up bypassing Two Guns for a quicker route, and for many, it would lead to the demise of the popular Two Guns town. Dawlish in Devon, England Dawlish is a beautiful picturesque holiday resort town on the coast of Devon and lies between the River X and the River Tain. The town does feel as if you've stepped back into another town where the wild birds flourish, and even the park feels like it came from another time. The beach, however, isn't anything special, so if you're interested in over-the-top high-rise motels and celebrity sightings, you're not going to get anything like that here. What you will see, however, is a simple beach with sand and shingles, as well as beautiful scenery with high cliffs and tropical plants. It makes for a great place to just sit and read a book, or even find a local to take you out on the water. The public gardens, the distinct and colorful alleyways, as well as plenty of bed and breakfast stops for a good night's rest make the town quite the charming little place. The shops are also lovely and have a very small town feel about them, which will make you feel instantly at home and as if you've stepped back to a much simpler day. Coleman Scott, Namibia. Houses and buildings still stand empty and packed with sand dunes in the middle of what once was a booming desert town near the coast of Luderitz. The buildings that still remain are of immaculate European architecture, including grand stately homes, a hospital, and even a casino and theater, all of which were destroyed by wind and sand dunes that left them almost completely buried. Hundreds of German families would flock to the desert because of rumors of a sudden mining fortune that had spread. And by the early 1900s, these families had tried their hand at making a fortune from diamond mining, since diamonds were commonly discovered sitting in the sand just waiting for someone to find them. Within a few years, hundreds of Germans came after the news that one railway worker had found a gem as he dug away from a railway line. And this would create a small community that resembled a quintessential German village in the middle of the desert. The town had become quite a hot spot and had all the modern conveniences of that time. 
a ballroom, electricity, a school, a bowling alley, a sports hall, even an ice factory and the first x-ray station in the southern hemisphere, as well as Africa's first tram system. But all of these modern conveniences couldn't really make up for a lack of air conditioning, along with the sandstorms that frequently came through the village, which destroyed the water which had to be shipped in. And that water would sometimes be so scarce that people actually bathed in soda water from the soft drink plant nearby. In the 1920s, 300 German adults, 40 children, and 800 natives lived within the village of Kolmenskop. There were quite a few interruptions that would halt the diamond production. These included the war, and it would finally completely stop in 1954. That's when everything then moved to a more profitable area in that time, and so the once beautiful bustling town of Kolmenskop was literally left in the dust. These days, some of the derelict houses and buildings have been restored, and others have become museum exhibits and interactive displays, and it's even been the setting for The King is Alive, a film that came out in the year 2000. With summer coming to a close and autumn approaching with Halloween soon to follow, it's curse season. Curses have been around for as long as humans have been superstitious. Believe in them or not, you can't deny the facts. These curses range from simple bad luck all the way up to death. Most of the time an object is cursed and those who touch it are cursed themselves, though this isn't always the case. 